presentation will be your master of ceremony for today's event. Welcome to the SMB Hall, Victor Building, University of Indonesia, where we'll be hearing guest lecture from Professor Matthew C. Stevenson, law professor at Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, United States of America, regarding the global fight against corruption, what we've learned, and where we're going. And warm welcome to the honorable guest, honorable Mr. Eliana Adamonkas, head of Board of Trustees, and Professor Melda Kamil Ariadno, head of International Office, Mrs. Mary Darsa, Mary Darsa and Co, and to get the legal consultants who have been help, helping us to grow with the uh, Stevenson. And last but not least, Professor Matthew C. Stevenson, law professor from Harvard University, and also the guest that has been waiting here. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting the lecture now. And so we still request you to move forward to fill the empty seat. And the agenda for today will be the welcome remark from uh, Mr. Eli and also Mrs. Mary Darsa. And guest lecture from Prof. Stevenson. And also 15 minutes for question and answer session and then closing. To commence this morning, Please welcome Mr. Eddie Hadjapamukas as the head of board trustees. And time is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Matthew. On behalf of the University of Indonesia, we welcome you. Uh, as you are aware, Indonesia is struggling for a long time and still a long and combating corruption. So, you are here to have a, a public lecture. It would be very useful for us. We have to learn from many uh, areas, from many perspectives, many angles. And okay, hopefully everybody will catch some of my news from uh, your lecture uh, this morning. So welcome and uh, thank you for Mary uh, for making this happen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eli, for the welcome remarks. And now we will have the welcome remarks from Mrs. Mary Darsa. Time is yours. Thank you, Noro. Pak Erin Jamal Munkes, Prof. Melda, Prof. Anna, dan Profesor-Profesor lain yang ada di ruangan yang saya ajak semua satu persatu uh, Lectures and Students of University of Indonesia Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua First of all, I am very pleased to be able to be here with Professor Matthew Stevenson from one of my two alma maters the first being University of Indonesia and the second being Harvard Law School Harvard Club of Indonesia was very fortunate to be able to be able to invite Professor Matt, Matthew Stevenson to come during this week in commemoration of International Anti-Corruption Day, which fell on 9th December 2017. As you know, uh, I had once run for KPK, and it had really is because at that time I felt that I had to make a statement that even ordinary citizens should have a, an attention and a focus on fighting corruption that we should not fear it because it is incredibly important. And as we know, the UN also said that actually corruption is a major threat to countries being able to achieve the development goals as well as sustainable development. As we know, our country is very much trying to achieve the, the growth potentials that everybody believes that it has. However, if we as a nation do not fully appreciate the threat of corruption for our nation and being able to be educated about it and being able to solidly together fight against it, then this will be continually, some potential of our country will not be fully realized. I also believe that by actually bringing Professor Matthew Stevenson, who is the anti-corruption expert from Harvard Law School, I think will bring a very fresh perspectives, especially given the fact that his topic will actually also talk about the topic from a global perspective, in that actually there are things that we can learn from our efforts worldwide 
and, and hundreds of years efforts of countries all around the world and how to fight corruption. In that way, we can also try to change the way we look at things, change the way we look at certain perspectives and perceptions, so that we also have a belief that corruption is actually a crime that we can fight together. Uh, I'm very honored that Professor Matthew Stevenson, when I met him the first time, actually, I did not have the pleasure to be taught by Professor Stevenson because I'm too old to be taught by him. <laughs> he joined the law school after I graduated in 1994. And uh, I met him in Korea, and he also, uh, at that time, he was actually the commemoration of 200 years of the Harvard Law School. Uh, uh, Harvard Law School. And uh, first of all, I want to apologize that I'm actually not facing everybody, but uh, since my attitude did not stand, I feel the same that I should not stand. <laughs> so please apologize. But so I, actually, I was so uh, enlightened by what he said, and I felt that what he said was truly relevant, and I felt that I wanted to actually see whether he would be willing to come to Indonesia. And fortunately, he's never been to Indonesia before. So this is the professor's first trip to Jakarta and to Indonesia. And hopefully this weekend, uh, assuming that everything is fine, it will be his first trip to Bali. Because most people say they've never been to Jakarta, but they've been to Bali. But so this is actually very happy that we're going to, we have actually introduced Professor Stevenson to Indonesia. Hopefully this is the first of many visits. Before I actually give the floor so that he can give you the talk that you all come here to listen, I would like to actually just share a little bit of a CD that I'm sure that you're well aware of because um, I think that it's very important for us to really appreciate uh, the expert that we have here with us. First of all, Professor Matthew Stevenson uh, has a bachelor's degree uh, from uh, Harvard College studying in East Asian Studies for which he graduated and then come out. And then after that, uh, he could not really decide whether he wanted to go focus on political science or law school, and so he decided to apply both for uh, the law school and a PhD in political science, for which he actually did at the same time, showing how much, how brilliant he must be, because doing one alone is probably very difficult. So actually, Professor Stevenson is a true blue Harvard grad, because all his degrees come from Harvard, and now he's also a professor of law at Harvard Law School, and he's, which he has joined since 2005. And um, he's actually also written many, many books in, in, in various topics, and also actually has a, has a blog on um, anti-corruption, which you can also look at. I mean, I think without further ado, I would like to actually give the floor to Professor Stevenson to give his talk, and uh, he's uh, very much willing to give an overview for about 30 to 40 minutes, and afterwards, he will entertain questions and answers. He is very much so happy to see, especially the students here, he would like to have interactions, and hopefully all of you will be asking questions so that this will be a very good session. The floor is yours, Matthew. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. It really is a great pleasure to be here. As Melly just mentioned, this is my first opportunity to come to Indonesia, to come to Jakarta. Uh, I've only been here for a few days, but I've just experienced nothing but incredibly warm hospitality, along with really rich, substantive engagement about topics that, that I care about and that are important to my country and your country and the world. So I'm really, really just uh, so grateful. And I'm also grateful to all of you for taking time out of what I'm sure extremely busy schedules. I, I gather that students have exams, uh, faculty I'm sure are busy with their own research projects, so really it's, it's very, I feel greatly honored to see so many of you here today to come listen to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly glad to have the opportunity dur during this trip to be able to speak at the University of Indonesia. I very much enjoy speaking with people from the government, from the private sector, from civil society, but I think I especially enjoy the opportunity whenever it comes to be able to interact with faculty and students and others in a university setting. Because I very much believe in the mission of the university to further education, to further scholarship, and deepen and enrich our understanding of the world around us and to equip us all in our own ways to help solve the fundamental problems that are confronting all of society. One of those problems is, of course, the problem of public corruption. 
the abuse of public power for private gain, whether it takes the form of bribery or embezzlement or misappropriation of public resources or favoritism, uh, nepotism, and so forth, there is ample evidence that corruption in various forms has a whole range of pernicious effects. Not only is it immoral in and of itself, uh, but it's bad for the economy, it's bad for uh, inequality, it undermines trust in government, it can endanger security and social stability, and for a whole range of reasons, it's a vitally important problem for all countries, and indeed the international community together, to tackle. And it really is a global problem. Corruption is a global problem. It's global both in the sense that every country in the world struggles with the corruption problem. There is no corruption-free country or corruption-free society anywhere. And it's a global problem in the sense that corruption itself is increasingly international. Corrupt actors and corrupt organizations don't necessarily respect national boundaries. And partly for that reason, effective responses to corruption must also be increasingly international. Both in the form of formal cooperation among nations, with respect to law enforcement, for example, and uh, with respect to informal engagement across national boundaries to better understand this phenomenon and how to combat it. The problem of corruption can be especially discouraging sometimes because it can seem so intractable, especially in countries that are beset by deeply rooted systematic uh, corruption problems that seem like they're impervious to any serious efforts uh, to root them out. At the same time, I do think there are some reasons for cautious optimism. Something really can be done about corruption, even in the most challenging environments. And although I'm not an expert by any means on Indonesian politics, and my remarks today will not focus on Indonesia, as an outsider, having learned something about your country and its recent history, particularly with respect to corruption, Indonesia seems to me to nicely capture uh, both the difficulty of eradicating corruption, just how hard it can be to, to uh, get that problem under control, but also some of the reasons for optimism, some of the reasons to believe that even in very challenging environments where corruption is a deeply rooted problem, it is possible to do something about it. And that's a thing that I hope to return to before the end of my talk. Um, but before I do, let me first say a few words about what I consider quasi-myths about corruption that I think it's important to address. And the, 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 the four, excuse me, the three quasi-myths I want to talk about are uh, widely held beliefs in some quarters about corruption as a phenomenon that are sometimes invoked, consciously or subconsciously, as rationalizations for not doing very much about corruption, for not making the fight against corruption a significant policy priority. I describe each of these three beliefs as quasi-myths rather than simply as myths, because as I'll elaborate in a moment, I do think that each of them does have a kernel of truth, which I want to acknowledge. So these are beliefs that do have a little bit of truth to them, but that I think are mostly false or mostly misleading. And it's important, I think, to address and debunk these beliefs right at the outset. So, uh, quasi-myth number one is that in many countries of the world, especially non-Western countries or cultures, uh, what the West would consider corruption is not actually considered bad. Uh, it's not considered corrupt. It's just part of the culture. You see this argument sometimes. People will say, well, it's true that in the West, this transaction looks like a bribe, but in some other cult country, it's just part of their gift-giving culture. Or that, well, it's true that we might think that hiring your unqualified relative for an important government contract is an act of corruption, but in other cultures, that's just part of the familial traditions of reciprocity and kinship networks and so forth. Um, so you see this argument occasionally to suggest that the anti-corruption agenda is really principally a Western agenda that's attempting to impose Western moral values on other countries and 
culture. Some have even sometimes described it as a neo-imperialist agenda. So I want to acknowledge the kernel of truth in this argument. The kernel of truth is that there are important differences across cultures in where that line between right and wrong uh, should be drawn. There are some subtle differences in when a gift becomes a bribe or when doing a favor for somebody becomes improper. So I don't want to deny that there are cultural differences, nor do I want to uh, uh, deny that uh, there are differences in views. Uh, but what I do want to deny, what I do think is a myth, is that the idea that certain kinds of conduct are corrupt, and that these forms of corrupt conduct are wrongful, is a very culturally specific Western notion. I actually think I probably don't need to say as much about this for this audience than I might to an American audience. It actually seems to be more often Westerners who have this idea that corruption is a uniquely Western idea. And people from other parts of the world, non-Western cultures, seem to understand very well that corruption is a problem and that it's something they don't like. Now, it is true that in some countries, corruption is more tolerated in the sense that people feel like they have to put up with it. But I think it's important to note that there's actually been quite a bit of social scientific research on this, survey research and, and other forms, that, that reveals that most people don't think that these kinds of corruption are okay. They might tolerate them in the sense that they feel helpless to do anything about them. But that's very different from thinking that they're right or proper. So I think it's generally not true that corruption is a uniquely Western concept or that the fight against corruption is, is part of a, a kind of neo-imperialist attempt to impose Western morals on other societies. It's, every society or cultural tradition of which I'm aware condemns bribery, embezzlement, abuse of public office, and so forth. So the second quasi-myth that I want to address is the idea that, especially in a developing country, Corruption can be good for the economy, or can actually help development uh, proceed more quickly. So there is this um, idea that even if corruption might be morally wrong, maybe it might still be good for the society. Because in a country where there are very burdensome regulations, where it's very difficult to do business legally, corruption can be uh, what people sometimes refer to as grease in the wheels of commerce, or grease in the wheels of the bureaucracy. That uh, the ideas that in the words of the Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington, that in a poor country trying to develop, the only thing worse than a rigid, inefficient, dishonest bureaucracy is a rigid, inefficient, honest bureaucracy. So this idea is still out there, and people will point to countries like China, for example, or other countries in this part of the world that have high growth rates and high corruption and say, not only is corruption not bad for the economy, it can actually be good. Here again, I want to acknowledge the kernel of truth in this argument. It's not completely false. There are some circumstances in which it is indeed true that paying small bribes to bureaucrats allows efficient businesses to get licenses they wouldn't otherwise be able to get, that it greases the wheels of commerce, that it allows certain kinds of act economic activity to move forward. So it can happen. I don't think uh, anyone would deny that it could happen. And maybe there are some countries that are so rigidly overregulated that corruption is the only way the system can possibly function. But overall, on the whole, this really is more myth than reality. There's been quite a bit of academic research on the economic implications of corruption, and on net, the weight of the evidence suggests that corruption is bad for economy. That more often than not, corruption is sand in the wheels of economic development, not grease in the wheels of economic development. This is not least because many of these inefficient, rigid bureaucratic regulations that people need to pay bribes to get around were created in the first place precisely to create opportunities for corrupt public officials to extract bribes. Right? So the people who argue that corruption can, can be an efficient grease will say, well, because the bureaucracy is so inefficient, corruption is a way to get around it. But the answer to that is it's precisely because corruption is so widespread that the bureaucrats create these inefficient systems in the first place. So again, I think it is, um, while there's a kernel of truth, where there is, the, there is this idea that under some circumstances, corruption can get around over-regulation, as well as the idea that over-regulation can 
itself be an important cause of corruption. The idea that corruption overall promotes economic development, I think, is not consistent with the weight of the evidence. Now, there's a third quasi-myth that I want to address, and this is the idea that corruption really is just a structural feature of societies or cultures, that there's very little that policymakers or reformers can do to change. So this argument suggests that, well, maybe corruption is immoral, maybe corruption is bad for the economy or bad in other ways, but it's just a fixed factor of certain societies that's not going to change. The idea is that being, being in a corrupt society is a little bit like being in a landlocked country. There's a lot of evidence that if you're in a landlocked country, it's bad for your economy. Transport costs are higher, development is slower, and so forth. But it doesn't help much to tell policymakers in a landlocked country who want to develop, well, one of your big problems is that you're landlocked, because there's nothing they can really do about it. And some people have suggested that corruption is kind of the same, that some countries just kind of got lucky and are not very corrupt, have low levels of corruption, and therefore uh, find it easier to promote entrepreneurship and development and so forth. And other countries are just stuck with a corrupt culture that's not going to change, and so they're disadvantaged in the same way that landlocked countries are disadvantaged. Again, I want to acknowledge the kernel of truth to this argument. The kernel of truth to this argument is that it does seem that corruption is a feature of societies that it is very difficult to change quickly or in the short term. If you look at some of these indexes that certain international non-governmental organizations have prepared to measure perceptions of corruption, from organizations like Transparency International, for example. These indexes have been compiled since the mid-1990s, and very, very few countries have changed very much on these indexes. Other measures of corruption similarly show very little change over a period of 10 or 20 years. And there are some reasons I'm actually about to get into in the next portion of my talk why corruption is really difficult to alter. It can be self-entrenching or self-reinforcing. So there is this kernel of truth to the idea that corruption is a feature of societies that's much more difficult to change than, for example, exchange rate policy or infrastructure investment. At the same time, though, I really do want to emphasize that this idea that societies are kind of dealt a hand, right? they, they get their cards, and one of them is how corrupt it is, and then they're stuck, uh, is more myth than reality. And I think the best way to illustrate this is to point out that among those countries in the world that currently do the best on these international corruption rankings, countries like Sweden or Denmark or the United States, for example, or Finland, all of these countries, all of these countries, at some point in their history, often not too distant history, had forms of systematic, widespread corruption that look not that different from most developing countries today. If you look at the early history of the United States, to some degree at the national level, the federal level, but especially at the state and local level, corruption was the way politics operated. If you look at Sweden in the early 19th century and before, the entire Swedish state was systematically corrupt. The UK, United Kingdom, famously struggled with very serious corruption problems at all levels of government. A country like Finland, which currently comes out near the top of some of these rankings, as late as the 1950s, according to some material I read recently, um, was so corrupt that the British Embassy warned British businesses about the hazards of doing business in Finland because the corruption was so high. So I think it's important to recognize that uh, systems that are not corrupt, right, they're actually the exception historically. And all those countries that have achieved lower levels of corruption went through a process of transition to get to that state. Now, it's a process of transition that often took decades, in some cases even longer. So it is a long, slow process that we don't yet fully understand. But I think it's important to resist this extremely pessimistic or fatalistic attitude that you sometimes hear when I travel to parts of the world that have systemic corruption problems, I sometimes hear people from those countries say, my country is, corruption is a way of life. There's nothing that can be done. It's deep in our culture. We're stuck. 
And what I often say in response is someone in Sweden in the year 1800 might have had exactly the same perception that corruption was just a way of life in the Swedish state. But it's not true that nothing can be done. Things were done in Sweden. Things were done in the United States. Things were done in the United Kingdom. Uh, things have been done in other countries, non-Western countries as well. So I want us all to not fall into the cynical trap of believing that corruption in a place like Indonesia is so entrenched, it's just part of the national culture or way of life that it, it, it's intractable and nothing can be done. That said, I do think that fighting against corruption is especially challenging um, because corruption does have this feature, which social scientists and other researchers I think increasingly recognize, that it is self-reinforcing or self-perpetuating. One of the root causes of corruption is corruption. Then, now that might sound a little either circular or, or, or trivial, but let me say a little bit more about what I mean uh, by using, uh, by illustrating the idea with a few of the different mechanisms by which corruption can be self perpetuating and create what we might refer to as vicious cycles. The first such mechanism is economic. As I was saying a moment ago, there's a great deal of research now that suggests that countries with widespread corruption tend to be poorer, and governments in those countries tend to have lower revenues and less efficient public spending. Corruption in general may discourage entrepreneurship, may discourage investment. And then with respect to government fiscal affairs, the tax system is likely to work less well. More people manage to avoid paying taxes. Those taxes that are collected are more likely to be stolen or misappropriated, and you're going to see more leakage from government programs. So corruption leads to, or can lead to, lower levels of economic development and lower government revenue. At the same time, many of the most effective techniques for reducing corruption, for getting corruption under control, require resources. You need substantial resources if you're going to pay your civil servants a reasonable salary. You need substantial resources if you're going to create a tax administration that is highly professional, that has enough well-trained people to carry out the government's uh, tax making. You need to have resources if you're going to create a judiciary and prosecution service that has high integrity and has the capacity to identify, prosecute, convict, and punish those who engage in corrupt conduct. You may need to have a sufficiently wealthy society for enough individuals in the society to be able to focus on something other than where is their next meal coming from and start paying attention to political engagement. So what this means is that Poverty and low government fiscal capacity contribute to corruption, but corruption contributes to poverty and low government fiscal capacity, creating a vicious cycle which can be very difficult to break. Many people believe, I'm not sure what, how, how strong the evidence for this is, but many people believe that the key to reducing corruption and bureaucracy is paying civil servants better salaries. At an event that, that I was able to attend on Monday, a representative from the Indonesian government made exactly this case. So if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. We've got to really increase civil servant salaries. The problem is if you're, if you're a really poor country, where's the money going to come from to double or triple civil servant salaries? But if you don't do it, and the civil servants remain corrupt, then the country's going to stay poor and government revenues are going to stay low. The happy version of this, though, is that the, the opposite situation can create kind of a virtuous cycle. If you get corruption under control, that can increase overall social wealth and government revenues, giving you more resources that you, you can then use to invest at least partly in controlling corruption more effectively and keeping it low. So you can have a, a vicious economic cycle, poverty and corruption usually enforcing, but the trick is how do you convert that to a virtuous cycle in which wealth or growth and integrity are mutually enforced? So that's one of the mechanisms through which corruption can create these vicious cycles. Let me illustrate it with a few more because there are many mechanisms by which this phenomenon can take place. A second has to do with law enforcement or deterrence. The more people who engage in corrupt activity, the lower the probability that any of them are going to get caught and punished which can weaken deterrence. I think that the best way to illustrate this idea is by using an example from a different kind of infraction. Consider uh, speeding on the highway. Actually, based on my few days in Jakarta, I don't think much speeding on the highway takes place because 
cars are moving very quickly. But, but use your imaginations, if you will, and imagine a highway where um, you have cars, some of which might be driving at the same speed, and some of which might be driving very, very quickly. And imagine you have a fixed number of traffic points. And for the moment, imagine that they're, that they're not corrupt, because that's not the point of this example. Well, if everybody is speeding, the traffic police can only pull over two or three people. So for any individual driver, the chance that they'll get pulled over for speeding is very low. Because there are a thousand drivers on the road and the police can only pull over three of them. So your chances of getting pulled over are only three in a thousand. So you might as well speed. The three people are unlucky, but when they're thinking about it ahead of time, they all speed. On the other hand, if nobody is speeding, if everyone else on the highway is driving the same speed, if I decide to speed, I'm definitely going to get caught and pulled over because I'm the only one doing it. The cops are looking for me. The same idea can apply to corruption. Right? Imagine a country like this. So we have a representative from the KPK here, so I can use this example. Um, imagine you have a, 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 an anti-corruption commission like the KPK, which has limited resources. They only have the budget to go after, let's say, 10 or 20 civil servants per year for engaging in corruption. If 2,000 civil servants are engaging in corruption, the probability that any one of them will get caught and punished by the KPK, even with the diligent efforts by the anti-corruption agency, is relatively low. It's just the numbers here. On the other hand, if most civil servants behave honestly, right, then any individual one that decides to behave dishonestly is very likely to, able to get caught. And I hope again you can see how this can create a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle. If many people engage in corruption, deterrence is weak. And the fact that deterrence is weak leads more people to engage in corruption. If few people are engaging in corruption, deterrence is strong, which means few people will engage in corruption. And again, the challenge is how do you make the transition from a seemingly unmanageable situation where even with diligent efforts by uh, resource-constrained law enforcement, the probability of getting caught remains low, to a situation in which the rate of attraction is small enough that a relatively modest investment in law enforcement can actually create substantial deterrence. Let me offer a third mechanism by which corruption or integrity can be self-reinforcing that I think may be even more important than, than law enforcement, and that does have to do with culture. But by culture, I actually don't mean national culture. I don't mean Western culture or Asian culture. I mean the set of norms and beliefs that affect how we behave. Most of us, I think most of the time, our decisions whether to engage in activity that's unethical or illegal may be affected by the probability of getting caught or punished, but I think most of us, most of the time, it's our own internal sense of shame or guilt that stops us from doing something wrongful even when we're pretty sure we can get away with it, or maybe the embarrassment that we know we might feel if our friends or colleagues or people in our social circle knew that we were engaging in this wrongful conduct. Now, in any society, there will always be some people who will try to pursue their own interests uh, regardless of ethics and regardless of what everyone else is doing. There are always some evil people or some sociopaths or some greedy people. There are also in every society always some people whose sense of moral right and wrong is so strong that no matter what everyone else is doing, they'll behave properly. But most people, I think it's fair to say, are very much influenced by what those around them are doing. Our sense of guilt or shame when we do something against the rules is influenced by our perception of how many other people engage in that behavior. And this is important because law is not enough, regulations are not enough, people need to self-regulate. And so if you're in a situation, if you're a civil servant, and you're in an office where you're pretty sure pretty much all of your colleagues are taking bribes, then when you get offered a bribe, again, maybe you're one of these people who sense, who sense of moral right and wrong is so strong you would never take it, but you might think, well, technically against the rules, but everybody does it. I'm sure all of you in your own lives have at some point either heard someone else say or maybe even thought to yourself, well, they tell me I'm not supposed to do this, but everybody does this. They say the speed limit here is 60 kilometers an hour, but everyone drives 70. 
It can't really be against the rules. Right? This happens, I think, quite frequently, and it can certainly happen with corruption. If there's a sense that it's technically against the rules, but everybody does it, people won't feel that ashamed or guilty if they engage in that behavior, and they won't be that embarrassed if other people know that. Well, again, you can see how this can create a vicious cycle. If corruption is widespread, people don't feel that ashamed to behave corruptly, which means more people will behave corruptly, and that belief that corruption is widespread will be, will be self-reinforcing, will be self-perpetuating. It becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. At the same time, if, if people believe that the others around them behave with integrity, don't engage in corruption, then the moral shame they would feel if they behave wrongfully, or the social embarrassment they would feel if their friends and colleagues thought they behaved wrongfully will be much stronger. And the consequence of this is that the amount of corruption will remain low. So again, the beliefs, this time the good belief that people generally behave with integrity becomes self-fulfilling or self-reinforcing. And the challenge again remains how do we simultaneously shift people's beliefs and behavior from a world in which, yeah, it's technically wrong, but everyone does it, so I'll do it too, to the world where maybe I could get away with it, but this is just not done here. I would do this thing that nobody else would do, just for a, a temporary benefit. Let me, at the risk of belaboring this point, let me give one more illustration of how uh, corruption can become this self-reinforcing or, or self-fulfilling prophecy that may be of special relevance to some of the university students in the room. And that has to do with uh, people's career choices, what they choose to do and where they choose to work. And here's what I have in mind. What kind of person chooses to become a civil servant, to go work for a government bureaucracy? Oftentimes, it's the kind of people you get, it's the selection process, more than anything that happens after people join, that determines whether the bureaucracy or a particular department will be characterized by corruption or integrity. So imagine, and for some of you this won't be that much of a stretch, that you're a bright young university graduate about to go out in the world, you're figuring out what you want to do. One option would be go to the private sector, maybe earn a lot of money, but you're thinking about, well, maybe I could go uh, work for the government. Well, if the government department that you're thinking of working for has a reputation for widespread corruption, where people are taking bribes, they're not really focused on the good of the country, but they can get they can get actually really wealthy there, maybe even wealthier than they can in the in the private sector. What kind of person will go work for such a government agency or department? Well, people with very strong moral scruples, people who are deeply opposed to corruption, are generally less likely to want to go work for a corrupt organization. They're not working there is going to be pretty miserable being surrounded by colleagues who you don't respect who are breaking the rules. Why not just go to the private sector and make a bunch of money? If you don't feel like you're really be doing good for the country and you're not going to take advantage of your position to get rich through corruption, that kind of person won't join the government in the first place. What kind of person will join a government bureaucracy that has a reputation for corruption uh, and, and lack of integrity? It will be people who lack integrity, who want to abuse their positions to make a lot of money, uh, or maybe people who are not competent enough to get a decent private sector job. Well, again, this becomes self-reinforcing. The people who join corrupt organizations tend to be themselves corrupt, and if there are people in the organization who are not corrupt, they'll often leave. They'll be miserable. They'll say, this is, why am I bothering with this? I'm, I'm miserable in my job. I'm not making a lot of money. There's corruption all around me. And I don't feel like I'm making a difference. And they'll leave. On the other hand, if you have a government agency or department that has a reputation for being one of high integrity, that's full of people who maybe they're not making as much money, but they're devoted to serving the country, and they believe they're really making a difference through improving government policy or creating effective government administration, um, and people don't take bribes. It's not a place you go to get rich. It's a place you go to serve the country. Well, what kind of person is going to join that bureaucracy? What kind of university graduate is that going to appeal to? It's going to appeal to the kind of person who cares more about public service than they care about making a lot of money. And it's going to appeal to people with high moral standards because they'll feel like they're joining an organization that exemplifies what they believe is good and important. 
So we again get this phenomenon where if you want to clean up the bureaucracy, one of the things you need to do is to attract people who will be people of high integrity. But the best way to attract people of high integrity is for them to perceive the bureaucracy as being clean. So again, the challenge is how do we break the vicious cycle and create a virtuous cycle? And it's very, very hard to do. Now, um, some people draw from the from the, the kind of analysis that I ja just laid out, the conclusion that the only way to do anything about corruption is through a kind of big bang approach, to change everything at once, very dramatically. And I think here, it is true that we have a few examples of, of successful anti-corruption big bangs. Hong Kong and Singapore are probably the most prominent examples, certainly in this part. But I actually don't think this understanding corruption, self-reinforcing nature necessarily implies that you have to do everything at once or not at all. I actually think quite the opposite. That form of analysis suggests that, that incremental reforms can make a difference, but they need, need to be sustained over time and gradually accumulate so you can eventually get to the tipping point where things can get a lot better rather quickly. You need to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, even when it seems like in the short term you're not very, making very much progress. Because eventually, you will reach a tipping point, or one hopes you will reach a tipping point, where anti-corruption interventions will start to make a much bigger difference much more quickly. So I think that the key to fighting corruption effectively is not necessarily a big bang uh, approach, but rather a sustainable approach, one that accumulates reforms over time and gradually makes things better. Uh, that would be the main takeaway that I would get. So one might naturally ask at this point, well, uh, if you want to improve the situation with respect to corruption and it's important to implement reforms over time and sustain them, well, what kind of reforms are we talking about? Uh, here, it's interesting because I, I do sometimes have the opportunity to meet with groups of anti-corruption reformers or people working at governments or organizations like the World Bank and, and the United Nations, and you often hear people using the rhetoric of game-changing innovations or silver bullets or the importance of thinking outside of the box. And um, I'm all for innovation, and I actually think there have been a number of quite important innovations in our thinking about how to tackle corruption over the last five to 10 years. But at the same time, I don't actually think that the major challenges in uh, getting corruption under control are technical. I don't think that the, the reason that many countries have not succeeded in controlling corruption is they haven't come up with the right policy instruments. Again, I, I'm in favor of innovation, and there has been in the last few years attention to an increasing number of new policy instruments beyond the traditional anti-corruption control measures that deserve attention. For example, I think the focus on asset recovery, asset tracing, recovery, and return uh, is very important. There's been increasing attention to the use of travel bans or visa denials to target individual high-level corrupt officials. There's been increasing attention um, in many countries, including the United States, to the problem of anonymous companies, the ability for not just corrupt individuals, but criminals of other varieties, and those who want to evade their taxes, to set up a complex series of shell corporations to hide their assets. So I do think there, there have been a number of innovative strategies to attack certain aspects of the corruption problem. But at the same time, I think about 85 to 90 percent of, of what we need to, to fight corruption, basically already they need strong laws, they need to be effectively enforced, they need to be enforced by institutions that have adequate resources and adequate autonomy and protection from political interference. You need an effective, impartial, fair court system. You need, within the bureaucracy, regular audits of government programs by competent auditors who, again, have the resources and autonomy that they need. You need uh, appropriate transparency with respect to government operations so that external actors can monitor uh, and detect potential wrongdoing. There's this package of stuff that I think we basically understand. 85 to 90 percent of what we need to do, we, need to, we know what it is. The problem is not knowing what to do. The problem is doing it. The problem is actually carrying forward uh, 
with a sustained, not a temporary crackdown, but a sustained overtime effort to accumulate anti-corruption efforts uh, and enforcement uh, to help us move forward. That's very hard to do, so I don't think it's really a technical problem. I think it's principally a, a political problem. The jokey analogy that I sometimes use, uh, some of you have heard me use before, uh, is the problem of um, losing weight, if you feel like you're, you're, you're heavier than you want to be, is in my view kind of similar to the problem of getting corruption under control, in that uh, every year it seems like people have their new silver bullet, pick out the outside the box solutions. You know, there's the, there are fab diets all over, the zone diet, South Beach diet, paleo diet, French diet, Mediterranean diet, you name it. But really, 85 to 90 percent of what we need to know about how to lose weight, we already know. You're supposed to eat a healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, not too much meat or refined sugar, and you're supposed to exercise regularly. We've known that for a long, long time. The reason many people, me included, have trouble getting our weight down to where we want it to be is not because we don't know how to do it. It's because we have trouble sustaining the effort in that direction. And also in this area, just like there are temporary anti-corruption crackdowns that then disappear, roughly every January or so, I have like a temporary weight loss crackdown that then dissipates quickly. And so the real problem is how do you sustain the effort over time? And here, I don't think researchers have come up with really good, clear answers for how one does it in the anti-corruption context. And the reason, and, and, and I think this is really important to focus on, because it is, I, I think the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem with, with addressing corruption effectively and moving from the, the vicious cycle world to the virtuous cycle world is a political problem. And the political problem takes the following form. The people with the strongest incentives to do something about corruption, the people who are most disadvantaged by a corrupt status quo, are often the people with the least ability to actually do anything about it. While, in general, the people with the most ability to do something about a corrupt status quo tend to be the people who have benefited most from that status quo and therefore won't have very strong incentives to do much of it. Typically, the losers don't have sufficient power and the winners don't have sufficient incentives to make change because, after all, they're winning under the existing system. So what can one do about this? Well, again, I don't think researchers have really nailed this down, but let me offer a, a few models that have emerged for countries that have managed to do something about corruption that can, they can deal with or somehow get around this fundamental political problem before offering some, some closing remarks and moving to Q&A. So one way you can, you can get around this problem is to have a leader who is very powerful, relatively few checks of his or her power, who is far-sighted and public-spirited, and very secure in his or her position, who can just decide that anti-corruption is a priority and push through dramatic reform to the society and aggressive enforcement of anti-corruption rules against those who break them. So this can work, or so it seems. This, I think, is the Lee Kuan Yew model in Singapore. Um, this, is, I think, also, also accurately captures Hong Kong, where it was still under British control. The governor general just decided this was going to be a priority. Um, you see this, I think, in places like the Republic of Georgia, where a very strong president has, has put, had pushed aggressive anti-corruption reforms. Uh, I think Xi Jinping in China very much is trying to embrace this um, so I don't want to dismiss it entirely, but I'm not a huge fan of the powerful single leader who wants to reform the society model. You can think of it as like the good king model. And the reason that I'm skeptical of this is, of course, this is great if you get a good king. But the basic idea of organizing a society where you concentrate so much power in one person is very dangerous, right? There are societies that have effectively dealt with corruption much more rapidly than any democracy because they had this concentration of power. But if you look across the world, many of the countries with the worst record on corruption and many other things have extraordinary powers concentrated in a single leader who's not really accountable, who's very secure in his or her power. Right? Until his recent removal, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe is kind of this example. So you might hope you'll get Lee Kuan Yew. You might end up with Robert Mugabe. And so I'm not necessarily enthusiastic 
about the idea that the way to fight corruption is to concentrate lots of power in an entity in the executive branch or the, the senior political leader and hope that that person is, is public spirited and does the right thing. Even though, for, for fast anti-corruption reform, that's probably the best one to vote for. A second model through which we sometimes get substantial anti-corruption reforms despite this fundamental political problem that I just described uh, occurs when you see moments of dramatic de uh, reform or crisis or disruption of the existing political status quo. Um, I actually think Indonesia may be an illustration of this, though again, I'm a little bit reluctant to comment on Indonesian politics because I'm not an expert, but my impression is that the transition from the Saharto period to uh, the contemporary Indonesian democracy, the Reformasi period in 1998, was such a of the status quo that it was actually possible to do things, to implement reforms, like the creation of the Kapika and the TP court courts and other measures that simply would not have been possible under ordinary political circumstances. So sometimes in a moment of crisis, you can effect changes that are much bigger than you could in ordinary times. After all, people don't know who the winners and losers are, right? They're behind, behind a kind of veil of ignorance in those moments of crisis or disruption. And that creates, admittedly, some danger, but also opportunity. Now, I think this is actually important. One of the implications of this is for those who care a lot about anti-corruption reform, be prepared. It might seem like you're laboring uh, with no result. You're developing all these ideas and proposals and, 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 and concepts for how the society can be improved, but nobody is listening because the people in power aren't interested in making genuine change. But if you put in that thought, and if people are well positioned, if there are civil society advocates and others, well-meaning people in the government and in the business community, then when a crisis comes, you'll probably have a fairly narrow window of opportunity to affect change, and you want to be prepared when that moment occurs. So I actually think this take advantage of a crisis approach to dealing with corruption is actually really important. At the same time, I think many people would say, well, that's nice and all, but we can't just sit around waiting for a political crisis. We probably don't even want to wish for a political crisis because they can cause more problems than, than uh, anything else. Um, so that's, that's fine. What, what else can be uh, done? So a third approach to getting around this fundamental political problem is to find ways to advocate and implement reforms, the consequences of which are either not obvious to those who are in power right now, or where the consequences are sufficiently long-term that the people in power right now are not too concerned. So, again, this is somewhat unsatisfying because you're not doing as much about corruption today, but I do think there is some evidence that even highly corrupt societies or countries where there's very little chance of doing anything in the short term, it's possible to put in place policies or institutions or structures that do have important, longer-term consequences for the fight against corruption. I think um, Brazil may provide a contemporary illustration in that, as many of you know, right now, there are ongoing investigations of corruption stemming from uh, activities of the Brazil, Brazilian state-owned oil company, Petrobras, that are being conducted by uh, quite independent prosecutors in an environment where there's very strong public support for doing something about corruption. I think that there's some evidence, although admittedly not conclusive, that the groundwork for the current investigations into Petrobras were actually laid 10 to 20 years ago under the administration of President Lula, whose administration was itself highly corrupt, where President Lula has himself been implicated in the current anti-corruption investigation. There were changes to the Constitution that gave prosecutors more autonomy and more power. There were substantial efforts to crack down on corruption at the local level, which even a corrupt administration at the central level is often happy to do. Uh, but those changes at the local level may well have affected people's attitudes towards corruption in ways that were quite productive. Um, so I do think it's possible to, to see these long-term changes growing out of reforms and right now in the, in the short term or to implement reforms where maybe people don't really fully appreciate the implications. So I mentioned before things like anonymous company uh, transparency. Might be able to get people on board with that by framing it as an issue of national security or an anti-drug measure. 
even though ultimately that will make it more difficult for powerful public and private sector actors to hide their assets. So sometimes there's an argument that, look, this is, a, this is partly about corruption and tax evasion, but let's frame it as about drugs and terrorism. So we frame it as about drugs and terrorism, we make more progress with those who are currently in political power, and they kind of won't necessarily realize or appreciate the fact that we're putting in place frameworks that will ultimately have an anti-corruption impact. So that's possible as well. But, but I think none of these three are entirely satisfactory, which brings me to a fourth, which I do think is, is absolutely critical, and the one that I want to emphasize, especially to this audience. And that's pressure from below, pressure from the society. So I describe the fundamental political problem as one where those who are most adversely affected by corruption have the least ability to do anything about it. Those with the most ability to do something about it have weak incentives, typically, to do anything about it because they're benefiting from keeping things the way they are. Well, one thing one can do in that situation is to try to change the political calculus by making it such that they feel like they have to do something, they have to address the problem, or the citizenry won't stand for it. Whether this is people pouring into the streets, as we've seen in places like Romania or Costa Rica or uh, Egypt, I can say we won't support it, and it has happened in Indonesia in the not too distant past, uh, to how you vote in national elections, to how in all sorts of subtle ways throughout the society people send the message that we won't tolerate corruption, we think it's wrongful, we don't think it's okay, we don't think it's part of our culture, we do think our political leaders can be held accountable. Individually, none of these things might seem like much, but cumulatively, cumulatively, they can add up to a great deal and can make even leaders who are not so excited about taking significant action against corruption feel like they have to, feel like they have no choice. And I think that I want to emphasize that observation, the conclusion of these remarks, because I do think giving a lecture to a place like the University of Indonesia, which is for your country what universities like my own, Harvard University, and some others like Yale and Stanford are um, back in the United States, these are institutions that have many missions, they promote education, they further knowledge, but they also train the elite of the next generation. Whether it's people who are already coming from elite backgrounds, who are getting that education and, and carrying on that tradition, or whether it's people from non-elite backgrounds, people who are the first in their family to go to a university, uh, in some cases the first in their family uh, to escape uh, rural poverty, it's their passport. But it's also a place, the is also a place that really is committed to fostering self-reflection, social advocacy, understandings of justice and values. So it's that combination, people who are members of the elite, who do have that power, more power than most people in my country or in your country, to actually make change, but who also, we hope, will not be satisfied with maintaining a status quo even if those people individually, personally benefit from that status quo. That group of people, which I, I hope and expect to include many of the people in this room, can often be key change makers. They're the ones who can really drive change. They're the business leaders who are not content to accept a status quo, even if they're the ones who can pull the strings and take advantage of their connections. They're the educators who foster the right set of values in the next generation. They're the public servants who do go into these bureaucracies that have reputations for corruption, but who won't stand for it and are committed to making it better. They're the civil society activists. They're the people with the, 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 the clout and the connections to get something done in the society, and who are also deeply committed to getting something done. And I ultimately think it's that group of people, really you, partly the faculty, but especially the students, who have an absolute vital role to play in transforming societies, many societies, including this one, from this vicious cycle where corruption begets uh, poverty and cynicism and ineffective institutions, which in turn begets more corruption, to societies that are characterized by virtuous circles where integrity promotes wealth, a rising standard of living, uh, a culture of honesty uh, and commitment to uh, a strong and effective government civil society. So that's what I have to offer by way of my general remarks, uh, but we have I mean, ample time, which is what I was hoping, 
for a question and answer session. So I'll stop there, and I don't know if someone else wants to keep the QR calling people or if I'm supposed to do that. We'll, we'll figure that out. Do we have a microphone? Or do you have microphones here? That's great. That, that's where I'll stop. general themes. So with, with respect to the idea that um, 
Can one rely only on strict regulations in fighting corruption? I think the answer is clearly no. Even in those countries that have relied on a very top-down, aggressive approach to fighting corruption that emphasizes laws and punishments, those that have been successful have not relied solely on strict regulations. There have to be other elements. Now, of course, maybe what you mean when you say you should be focused just on strict regulations is there are a risk that anti-corruption rules can become too strict and go overboard. Um, and then the answer is also yes, I think that's right, even though I tend to take the view that because corruption is such a big problem, aggressive anti-corruption enforcement is appropriate. There are, are maybe two points that I would highlight that maybe would suggest some caution how aggressively we pursue corruption. One is that I do think that prosecutors should exercise some discretion in terms of the sanctions that they seek for particular infractions. It's not the case that we should always punish every infraction for regulatory or for regulation or the law to the, the maximum extent. I think we it's important for prosecutors to make sure, you know, to quote the old musical, that the punishment fits the crime. Um, and so I, I do think that, that there is a role for mercy and moderation, even when dealing with a serious problem like corruption, especially when infractions may be unintentional, say. Uh, second, I do think there is a risk under some circumstances that well-intentioned anti-corruption laws make it so difficult to do certain things that we discourage conduct that we want to encourage. So I, I, I know that, for example, you mentioned infrastructure projects. Some complain that when you get excessive anti-corruption regulations, people will simply stop doing projects because it becomes either too risky or too cumbersome because the rules are too hard to comply with. And that can happen. Uh, I don't want to deny that that can happen. There's evidence that in the United States, for example, there's a well-known study by the, the state of New York that, that looked at how a series of anti-corruption reforms, each of which seemed by itself sensible, accumulated over time to the point where it was just too hard for the government to do anything because there were all these prophylactic rules. So I, I do recognize that as a problem. To me, if one confronts that problem, the solution is not to dispense with aggressive anti-corruption enforcement, it's to change the rules so that they're more sensible, and to make sure that we're not overly burdening people, making it too hard to act, but, but at the same time, keeping in place a regime that really does uh, stand for the idea that corruption is wrong and should be sexually punished. So I, I don't tend to support the idea that, well, it's not such a big deal, we should just back off a, a legal enforcement strategy and hope for a longer-term cultural change. I do think that uh, legal enforcement is an essential part of fighting corruption effectively, and, and uh, we shouldn't send the message that we don't take corruption seriously. We need to send the message that we take it very seriously, while at the same time not overdoing it. Thank you. Uh, maybe on the back. Good day, everyone. My name is Robertus Janipas. Test, 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 test. Test, test. Test, test. Good day. Good day, everyone. My name is Robertus Janipas from uh, my question, Professor, why you see Indonesian as more ideal model than st strong leader model like Singapore to fight and eliminate corruption? Because yes, we have anti-corruption commission KPK, but still most people in here not afraid do corruption and more like sometimes it's like corruption is culture do it govern people sorry okay, 
Why, why is he Indonesian model? is more ideal than strong leader model like I see from Lithuanian Prime Minister. Because Indonesian people, corruption is more like culture habit. Even there is KPK every day catch people who do corruption. Thank you. Right, so with respect to this, I don't think I talked actually about the Indonesian model exactly. Um, although I suppose I alluded a little bit to, in my, in my last set of remarks, about the way I would see a country like Indonesia being able to move forward. But with respect to the, the so-called Singapore model, I think I'll just repeat what I said in my lecture by way of response, which is that the, the Singapore model, where you have a very powerful executive committed to fighting corruption and very few checks on its authority, and the ability to implement very harsh measures, uh, may work well if you get a leader who is genuinely committed to doing the right thing at least on this issue, but that model generally can go horribly wrong. This is why I said you know, if you decide to concentrate all your power in your chief executive, maybe you'll get Lee Kuan Yew or maybe you will get Robert Mugabe. Uh, or Suharto, for that matter. I mean, there was a really powerful executive who probably could have done a lot to clean up corruption if he had chosen to do so, uh, and chose, as far as I can tell, not to do so. So that was why I suggested that, uh, although you can get really good outcomes if you have essentially an unchecked leader who does the right thing, you can get disastrous outcomes if you have an unchecked leader who does the wrong thing, which is one of the many reasons I think having an unchecked leader is, on average, not such a great idea. Now, you say in, in Indonesia, corruption is a cultural habit, and even though we have the Kapika, uh, many people are not sufficiently deterred from engaging in corrupt activity. Uh, that may well be. I mean, based on what I know about Indonesia, I, I would tend to agree. Um, but if the implication of your question is therefore in Indonesia there will not be progress unless we have a new strongman, like a Lee Kuan Yew type figure, who takes aggressive action, there I would tend to disagree, and I would tend to disagree for two reasons. One is, as I just said, if you create that new strongman position, there's no guarantee it will be a Lee Kuan Yew rather than a Robert Mugabe. Second, I wouldn't be quite as pessimistic about the capacity of a country like Indonesia eventually to achieve substantial changes. It will take a long time, it will be very frustrating, but we've seen many examples of countries that over a period of decades really are able to affect significant changes. Um, and I do think, again, based on my, my, what I read about Indonesia as an outsider, is that although there are still enormous problems, the situation today with respect to corruption looks substantially different than it looked 15 years ago, um, in, a, in a way that's productive, that suggests movement in the right direction. I also tend not to think, as I said in my remarks, that cultures are absolutely immutable. They're very hard to change because they're self-reinforcing, but they can be changed. And you know, I think about fighting corruption, it's a little bit like if you're climbing a very tall mountain and you're halfway up, and you look up at how far you have to go, it can be extremely depressing and discouraging. On the other hand, if you look behind you and see how far you've come, it can be very inspiring. You really can make a lot of progress. So that's the kind of attitude or spirit I hope one can inculcate in a place like Indonesia. There's a very long way to go. One shouldn't be complacent. The problem is not solved. But boy, look how far this country has come on this issue in just barely 20 years since the Reformasi period. Um, that's in, in very challenging circumstances that you all are better aware of than I am. That strikes me as actually very encouraging and something I think that one can build on. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, one there, one there. Okay. okay. Uh, do you want to have comments? Um, thank you, sir. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Jessica from Faculty of Psychology. 
thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I, your remark about uh, the importance of strong law enforcement to eradicate corruption. Uh, well, uh, one of corrupt institutions in this country, at least according to surveys that we publish, is uh, law enforcer, um, uh, especially police and police inst uh, institution and uh, court. Uh, what do you think about this matter, uh, that institution that should be the champion to eradicate, eradicate corruption, but uh, they uh, do for us? Uh, what do you think about this, or how you experience about this matter? Thank you. Yeah, so this is one, one, one of the areas where I think Indonesia is actually a quite striking example that many other countries are looking to as a sort of model, actually, whether you all are aware of this or not, because what Indonesia did in, in the Reformasi period, recognizing that both the traditional police and the, the existing courts were so thoroughly corrupt that they could not be trusted to take aggressive against corruption, is to create a new parallel set of institutions, the KPK, to take over many of the investigative, uh, law, prosecutorial law enforcement functions, and the TP Court courts, the specialized anti-corruption court system, uh, with a special and different procedure for selecting judges. Now, my understanding is the constitutional court in Indonesia kind of screwed up the TV court court system with what, as an outsider, seems like a very hard to understand constitutional rule. So that has put that to the side. But, but I do think that the Indonesian approach to this problem, which is a problem that afflicts many, many, many countries that, that suffer from corruption, is quite striking because it created a whole separate, like a special anti-corruption agency with police and prosecutor functions and a special anti-corruption court with judicial functions. And again, the, the perception of this is that it's been generally successful. Obviously, big problems with considering how many each, the challenges that Indonesia faces um, uh, better than people than, it would, than the country would have done. Many people think if there was an attempt to fight corruption through the existing institutions. So currently, countries like. Ukraine, for example, uh, are actively studying Indonesia's specialized anti-corruption court system to see if they should do something similar. Um, now, the general problem that you raised, though, I do think is absolutely fundamental because if fighting corruption requires effective law enforcement institutions, if those law enforcement institutions are themselves corrupted, then you're not going to make any progress, which is why many people think that if you're setting priorities in terms of fighting against corruption, the first thing you need to do is clean up the judiciary and clean up the prosecutor's office and the police, because then if you don't do that, nothing else is, is going to work. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that idea. In the United States, one of the things that was uh, proved important in dealing with a very similar problem was the fact that the United States has a, a federalist structure. I, I don't know that much about Indonesia. I imagine there's something similar, and I think since Reformasi more so, where there's more autonomy among the provinces with respect to central government. But in the US, we actually have two parallel systems, a system of state courts and prosecutors and a system of national courts and prosecutors. And in the United States, over the course of, starting the 20th century, there were really aggressive efforts by the federal government, the national government, to clean up corruption at the state level. Because at the state level, it was a similar problem. Uh, the judges and prosecutors and police were all part of the same corrupt political machine that controlled or dominated the city or sometimes the state government. And so it took an outside entity, the US federal government, to come in and, and clean it up. So I, I definitely think that uh, addressing the law enforcement apparatus is, is absolutely crucial. With respect to the police in particular, what the, the powerful president of the Republic of Georgia that I mentioned before did as one of his first major anti-corruption reforms is he fired all of the traffic police. All of them. Uh, I don't know if it's literally all of them, but something like two-thirds, and replaced them very quickly. I'm still not sure, actually, how he pulled this off, why people weren't just getting in massive traffic accidents for the, for the transitional period. But he, and again, this is, the, uh, this is an example of what you can do with a very strong leader if he's, if he's takes fighting corruption seriously, the view was that corruption was so uh, thoroughly pervasive among the traffic police that he just got rid of all of them, uh, or almost all of them, and hired a whole new crew of people. 
um, which is a very dramatic, more widespread example of essentially what Indonesia did with respect to the Kapikara Batika Court courts, right? We can't, it wasn't like you fire all the judges and replace them with new judges, but you created a whole separate court system and had special judges in just that court system. So sometimes, sometimes you do need that kind of very dramatic effort to completely reshape things. Another thing you sometimes see uh, in a country like Guatemala is an international one. Guatemala actually has this uh, entity known as CICIG, C-I-C-I-G, which is an acronym for its Spanish name, the English translation of which is essentially the Anti-Impunity Commission. And CICIG was created as a UN-sponsored body. Originally, the intention was to focus on war crimes committed in the Guatemalan Civil War, but its mandate was broad enough that it actually started investigating corruption. It doesn't actually have prosecutorial or judicial power. It has to cooperate with local um, entities, but it was able to do these investigations that expose systematic corruption in the Guatemalan government, ultimately forcing both the president and the vice president to resign because of a major scandal. Many people think that investigation would not have happened if it was only domestic Guatemalan institutions subject to more direct political interference that had this responsibility. So that's a very dramatic example that I think most countries would be reluctant to accept where there's actually an outside international body that takes over some of these functions. So that can occur as well, although I'm not sure it's something I would endorse in most countries. I hope that gets at some of your questions. It's a very, very difficult problem to address. Thank you. Um, Mr. Do you have a question? Any uh, nice uh, excellent lecture, Professor Stevenson. Uh, first of all, I would like to also make a comment on the situation of, on corruption in Indonesia. I fully agree with you that uh, political problem is root of the corruption problem, especially in Indonesia. Because uh, one, root, one root of problem is, uh, is uh, because the democratic social legal factor is related to the high political cost for election. Therefore, because of this high political cost in the election, then uh, the, uh, the elected official, especially in the whether in the, especially in the in the region, is uh, then try uh, or, or do a corruption. So it's a uh, uh, important factor in Indonesia. And related to you also mentioned about the process of transition, uh, and then so we can uh, solve the problem of corruption. And I just wonder what is a uh, kind of transition is done by countries like Finland, maybe Sweden, and others, so that it can be relatively clean from corruption as it is now. Maybe we can learn something from what happened in, in Finland and other countries uh, that could be applied in, in Indonesia for the, the model of uh, combating corruption. Thank you. Um, those are both terrific questions. Um, let me take the first one first. So if you're first, first more of an observation of the question, but I think it's, a, it's an important observation that in Indonesia, the high cost of campaigns, of, of running and for winning office, creates a situation where corruption is highly likely because it's impossible or very difficult to raise the funds you would need to win an election legally. And so people raise them illegally. So I guess what I would say about that is it suggests, first of all, uh, this very important point I think it's sometimes overlooked, the fight against corruption, including the legal fight, the fight against corruption through law, should not be limited to criminal laws that are about punishment. It also has to do with changing other legal structures that address some of the root causes of corruption. So one that I, I alluded to, I think briefly in my opening remarks, is in countries that are over-regulated or just impossible to get a business permit in a reasonable time without corruption, yeah, you should punish people who break the rules, but what you really should do is reform the regulatory system so you can get a, a permit more quickly or so you don't need as many. Your point highlights another uh, type of law that may affect corruption incentives, and that has to do with election law, campaign finance law, um, where if you set up a system where it's just too hard to win elections unless you raise money illegally, people are gonna raise money illegally. And the people who are not willing to raise money illegally won't win the elections. So it, it, again, it becomes kind of self-perpetuating. I think that's right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in campaign finance law generally, and I would be extremely reluctant to make comments about what Indonesia's campaign finance law ought to look like. 
So I, I won't say specifically what Indonesia ought to do other than to generally agree with your observation that you need to create a situation where people who are campaigning for public office can raise and spend funds lawfully. I think also what you're seeing, again, I'm reluctant to say too much about Indonesia because I don't know the history of these laws, but in many countries I think you see well-intentioned efforts to regulate political finance that are based on this idea of which you also see common in discussions of US politics, that there's too much money in politics, and we should crack down on money in politics and not allow politicians to raise lots of money from private sources or limit the amount of spending they can do on political advertising. But as your point highlights, there could be a negative unintended consequence of those kinds of regulation if it just drives political financing underground. So I very much agree with, with the overall uh, thrust of your observation. Your second question is um, what explains this transition that many countries made from a, a kind of world of high corruption to a world of at least lower corruption? And it's a great question, and I fear I don't have a good answer because this is, this is something that people are still trying to study actively and to understand. Countries are very different, so it might be hard to, to come up with, with a set of common uh, causes, but I do think uh, there are some lessons that maybe we can draw. Uh, in Sweden, my understanding, my, my limited reading of the history, I'm not an expert in Swedish history, is that you had a series of reforms to the bureaucracy. Civil service reform was really important, creating a meritocratic bureaucracy, um, limiting nepotism, limiting the sale of offices, and creating a culture of integrity. Stimulated, I gather, by, the, by losing a war. So, you know, you never want to recommend a country that what you should do about your corruption problems to get to a war and then lose it. Uh, but this does connect to the point that I made in my talk, that it's often in moments of crisis that one can effectuate good government reform. So in Sweden, again, only based on what I've read, not being an expert, those who were interested in good government reforms in Sweden in the 19th century took advantage of this crisis to say, well, look, the reason we lost the war is because our generals are incompetent and our government can't raise tax revenue. We really have to fix that. So they were able, they were able to take advantage of that. In the United States, uh, I do think that uh, the rise of incomes and the growth of the middle class probably had a lot to do with it. Changes in media technology actually seem to have had something to do with it. In the United States, in the late 19th century, big cities like New York City might have had multiple newspapers, but most cities would only have one newspaper, and the newspaper had to be funded by a political party. Newspapers were not self-sustained through advertisement. Their subscription bases were too small, their production costs were too high. And it meant most newspapers were highly partisan, and the way they reported on corruption was very distorted, which was bad for uh, people holding the local political machine accountable, the local political machine control the newspaper. The de my understanding, based on my reading of the economics literature that studied this topic, is that technological changes leading to a decline in the price of newsprint made it economically viable for newspapers to enter a market and to become financially self-sustaining through selling advertisement and subscriptions. And once that happened, then these smaller to medium-sized cities might have not just one newspaper backed by a political party, but, but two or more newspapers that would compete with each other. And since the people purchasing the news might want to read the actual news, if your news was too biased or distorted, you might lose customers. So that, that, and there does seem to be evidence that the way corruption scandals were covered by American newspapers shifted dramatically between, say, the 1870s and the 1930s, and many, and, and some scholars believe that this change in technology drove it. Now, of course, that very interesting questions about whether our current media revolution, the rise of the internet and social media, is also going to have a change for better or maybe for worse in the ability of media to uncover uh, and, and help hold government accountable for engaging in corrupt behavior. There's also this very disturbing trend we've seen, especially in the United States, I don't know about Indonesia, where now there's so much media diversity that people can self-select into only reading the media that they kind of agree with or they tell themselves what they, want, what they want to hear, which in some ways takes us back to the world of the 1870s, although for different reasons, where the news that people are receiving is very much distorted through a, a partisan political lens, which can be very, um, very bad. Uh, I do think that there is, there is evidence, and this, I'm going to connect this back to the larger question you asked, that a free and independent media, while not necessary in all cases for controlling corruption, again, look at places like Singapore, uh, can often be a very valuable
valuable and productive force, coupled with civil society uh, that can take advantage of media reporting to really push these issues and call attention to them. And I do think that the rise of independent press, a robust independent press, with real investment capacity in many of these Western countries played a very important role in the reduction of corruption in those countries. Not by itself, but played a very important role. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we've met before on Monday, so uh, I want to ask, uh, in that occasion, I asked about Stephen Sheffield conception. Today, I will also ask about Stephen Sheffield, yet in a different question. My question is, do you believe that those who committed a corruption activity should be highly fined instead of in prison? Because many people believe that white collar crime are more is a more money-oriented uh, crime. Thus, to tackle the issue, we need to highly find them instead of uh, imprison them. Yet, your colleague, Stephen Shackle, argues that even monetary sanction has its limits. Well, when it reaches its limits, the non-monetary sanction are actually better. What's the limit? Well, there are several of them, yeah, uh, but two points is the most relevant, I think. The first one is the offender have a high possibility to invade the law. The second one is the offender have a high amount of wealth. Uh, for the reason, uh, your friend in Harvard, Shackle, argues that if uh, monetary sanction used for this offender, it is tantamount to legalizing a criminal conduct because he will easily pay the fine. Just like in Indonesia recently, our uh, Speaker of the House uh, involved in the corruption cases. He is well paid, mega rich, and has an ultimate political power. He could easily evade the law. Uh, do you think we should uh, find instead of imprisonment? The second one is uh, your friend in Harvard, Cousin Stein, and Richard Fowler proposed the behavioral economics concept, which brilliantly drives people's uh, choices uh, towards the regulator wants to. However, unlike the law economics, which uh, regularly used in the legal concept, these behavioral economics, I've never read the, and I've never read the story that uh, a criminal policy, especially an anti-corruption policy, that based on behavioral economics conception. Uh, using that framework, do you have any suggestion? Uh, what is the good anti-corruption policy using that? behavioral economics. And last one, I just want to respond to uh, another question. I, I think Indonesian people, uh, I, I think the fight against corruption in Indonesia cannot be started by the society itself. I don't know, I think the Singaporean style is more fit for Indonesia because I think the Malayan people are, well, I don't know, unlike you Americans and European have, who has a, who had an awful of all historical uh, stories with the kingdom. We, the Malayans, are when we get along with the kingdom. I don't know. Maybe we are. We need someone that we can look up to. Therefore, if we have a good king, there will be a good uh, servant, just like the Singapore. I think that's all. Thank you, Professor. All right. There's a lot there, and I know. Conscious of the fact that we're approaching the end of our time, but let me try to say a little bit on each of these things. So, your first point, I think in some ways you answered your own question. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, the question, I was summarizing an argument or an analysis developed by my colleague Stephen Chevelle raising the question of why in criminal law one would ever use non monetary sanctions. And the idea is well, if you can always uh, find somebody, what would be the reason to ever imprison them or do something else? After all, if you imprison them, you're imposing social costs and imposing other costs on them. Whereas if you find them, uh, you can just set whatever fine would equal the value that that person would attach to not going to prison, and you get equivalent deterrence. And then Professor Chevelle says, well, so that, that creates a, a, should create a presumption in favor of uh, monetary sanctions, but uh, there are some explanations that he then develops for why you would sometimes want to use non-monetary sanctions. One of them is if uh, people's wealth is high enough that they would always be able to bear any non-monetary sanction. Another one, uh, which I'm not sure if you mentioned, but it's definitely present, is some people uh, have sufficiently low assets that they just they go bankrupt. 
can extract all of the money they've got and it wouldn't be enough of a, of a punishment. So um, that, that strikes me as a very interesting uh, analysis. I think there's a lot to it. What do I think about it? I mean, I tend to think that in the context of corruption, both monetary and non-monetary sanctions are likely to be uh, important. I think that uh, from a deterrence perspective, although Chevelle's analysis is quite uh, persuasive and analytical exercise, it's unrealistic in most cases that we'll be able to do the calculation of what a uh, monetary sanction ought to be in each individual case. Uh, and that if what we want is deterrence, then as a rule of thumb for particularly egregious conduct, incarceration might be a best first approximation, especially as compared to a monetary sanction. And as you say, answer, answering your own question, uh, Chevelle's very arguments for why non-monetary sanctions are sometimes necessary absolutely would apply in at least grand corruption cases. Uh, I certainly agree that monetary sanctions are important and should be imposed when possible. Um, but there's a role for non-monetary sanctions as well. With respect to uh, behavioral economics, again, for those of you who don't work in this area, the idea here is that uh, social science researchers increasingly understand that while the classic economic model of human behavior, calculating costs and benefits, uh, is a useful approximation in many circumstances, that's not actually how human beings make decisions. And in fact, uh, there are ways to, the human beings predictably deviate from perfectly rational behavior. And then Professor Richard Thaler, my colleague Professor Kat Sunstein, among others, have taken this the next, to the next step and said, it's possible to, the way they put this, nudge people uh, to engage in certain kinds of socially desirable behavior using techniques that don't necessarily work on their material economic incentives would change the way that choice situations are framed, for example. And the question is, uh, could this be used in the corruption or anti-corruption setting? The answer is yes, and there are some people who have already started thinking about doing this, principally in the context of within bureaucracies, what one can do to make people more conscious of the fact that they're supposed to do, uh, do things a certain way and not do things uh, another way. Uh, or, or maybe to suggest some of the reasons why certain anti-corruption measures might backfire mm -hmm. if they undermine uh, social norms against behaving in a corrupt ways. So given that time is so limited, I'm not going to be able to, to run through a list of examples. Uh, but the only other thing I would say on this is the specific kinds of approaches that Thaler and Sunstein advocate in their nudge book, it seems to me, are difficult to apply in the corruption context because corruption is typically a deliberately unlawful or unethical act committed to achieve a benefit. So it's hard to see exactly how you nudge people into not being corrupt. Thaler and Sunstein have in mind things like uh, if instead of making employees sign up for a retirement savings plan, if you sign them up automatically and give them the option to opt out, you've equally respected their freedom, but you've nudged them towards doing something they should be doing anyway. It's hard for me to see good analogies to that if you're talking about taking bribes as opposed to forgetting to contribute to retirement savings. Your last point, actually I, I have to confess I'm a little bit disturbed by how much attraction there seems to be in this room to the Singaporean strongman approach to fighting corruption. I, I guess I see where it comes from and that if you're living in a society where this is such a pervasive problem, that it, it, it may be attractive to say, let's just find someone who can clean it up a powerful figure who just cracked down. And um, that's worrisome to me. It's worrisome to me partly for the reasons that I gave an answer to the previous question. I mean, the strong man might not actually be, be so great. Uh, it's worrisome to me also because even if the strong man does take effective action against corruption, they might be doing a whole bunch of other things that are not so appealing. I and mean, I think it was this, this impulse, that I want a strong man impulse, that explains the success of Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. And I find what he's been doing their corruption was a bit of it, it was mainly drugs. I think we can all recognize the Philippines as a, as a huge drug problem, it's a major social problem, but the way Duterte is going about addressing that problem strikes me as very, very troubling. And I, I, so it worries me, maybe you guys are representative, maybe you aren't, it worries me that there's this sentiment among Indonesian young people that we're, we're sick of this democracy now, we just want a, a strong man to lead us with a firm hand. I think that's very, very dangerous. Uh, I think in my own country we're seeing examples of how dangerous it can be that appeal to the strong man who says, I can solve all of your problems. Um, 
not being uh, Malay, not being Indonesian, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to, to make comments about what the Malayan people are like, but, but I have to say, I also resist very strongly, I think this instinctive resistance to the idea that there's some essential thing about the Malayan character that means you all need a strong leader that you can look up to as a, as a father. Um, I resist that for a couple of reasons. One is, as I suggested in my talk, many countries have that idea traditionally. It's not like this part of the world that traditionally thought of the leader as the father and the people are, uh, as the children who needs to be ruled with a strong hand. That was true historically just about everywhere that I know. Those ideas changed. Ideas about the appropriate relationship between the ruler and the ruled changed. The idea that the ruler is not really the ruler but a public servant is a relatively modern invention even in the West. So I tend to resist very strongly these cultural essentialist arguments about the way certain people from certain parts of the world or from certain religions just inherently are, because we've seen those changes. We've also seen enormous diversity within these cultures. And I've, I've only met a few Indonesian people. I've only been in Jakarta for a short time. But this is a country, what, 240 million people? It's very diverse in terms of people's attitudes and understandings, and these things can change quite a bit. I think that I would be very reluctant to embrace a broad stereotype about what Indonesian people or the land people are like. Especially because this, going back to the 1980s and 1990s when people talked about Asian values, has often been a rhetorical tool that authoritarian or conservative political leaders use to manipulate the public and to manipulate outside public opinion, and I think often does not reflect the spirit of the Indonesian people. It was the Indonesian people that did reformasi, right? It was the Indonesian people who did that just as much as anything else. So you know, I'm perfectly happy to have a conversation about whether what Indonesia really needs is, is a strongman type leader right now in this moment. My instincts are against, but I recognize there's a legitimate debate to be had about that. But I would be even more reluctant to locate as an explanation for one or another political choice something deep in the spirit of the, of the Indonesian or Malayan people. I actually think that, uh, while not knowing as much about this country or culture as I should, you see that argument made all over the place, and it's almost never true.